Okay, it's my privilege to introduce our final speaker of the uh, conference this year, uh, Dr. Glennon Thompson, who's not only the pastor of Jarvis Street Baptist Church, but is the president of Toronto Baptist Seminary. It's a delight to work with him, and, and uh, we're looking forward to this exposition of Desiring a Better Country. The expression, they desire a better country, that adorns the Canadian coat of arms, suggests that Hebrews 11, 16 may, in some sense, be applied to this nation. And there is a sense in which Canada is a better country. If you travel, you will find that there are places that you would rather not live. If you watch the news, you hear of catastrophes, disasters, wars. You recognize how privileged we are to live in a country of spectacular beauty, considerable wealth, and enviable security. It is a better country on many fronts. It is just not the better country of Hebrews. The writer, when he spoke these words or wrote these words, wrote to Hebrew Christians, perhaps at the center of the empire, in the throes of an alarming spiritual crisis. As one writer says, it appears that some of them were slipping into a nominal Christianity. They were hankering, as we heard earlier, after the good old days, the good old days of Judaism, because of the magnetism or the magnetic charm of the temple, the ritual pomp of the priesthood, and the solemn atmosphere of its sacrifices. And so the writer of Hebrews, in order to convince his audience to reverse course, compares all that they once possessed in Judaism to all that they now have in Christ. And he comes to this conclusion that Christ is infinitely better. And precisely because Christ is better, he warns against drifting into the state of apostasy. Cannot develop that here, done so elsewhere. Nevertheless, he encourages them to persevere in hardship, just as they did at the onset of their Christian experience, when they endured a great struggle with suffering in chapter 1032. And yet the writer recognizes, if you read chapters 10 and 11 together, recognizes that perseverance is not automatic, that believers must endure, but they endure by faith by a living, active faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that leads into the extended discussion that we have in chapter 11, 1 to 40, on this trope of faith, or pistis. And what the writer does in chapter 11, some 18 times, with this repetition of pistis, faith, is to move through the distinctive stages of salvation history beginning with the earliest heroes of faith to those who lived during the period of the judges until the advent of Christ. And the recital of these heroes and heroines of faith underscores one central truth. That is, faith represents the singular, the distinctive means by which all of God's people, from the commencement of time, persevered in allegiance. It is by faith that all of God's people have persevered. In this recital of the heroes of faith, he reserves ample space for Abraham and his descendants in verses 8 to 11. And as he discourses on Abraham's faith, Abraham and his wife Sarah, he includes this central section in verses 13 to 16 
to demonstrate that the patriarchs shared the same forward-looking eschatological faith that, they, that was found in their father Abraham. And chapter 11, verse 16, is really a summary statement. You see that just by the very language. But now, resumptive, but now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Verse 16 depicts the country by which, for which the patriarchs longed, yearned intensely. That's what the language there in verse 16 suggests. So if you read the New King James, it says they desire a better country, but it is, it is much stronger than that. They were yearning intensely for a better country. A better country which he defines briefly as better because it is the heavenly country. And so the better country of this text refers to that heavenly country. My task is to seek to sketch briefly the contours of this heavenly country that they sought. First, the better country for which the patriarchs yearned represents the ultimate goal of pilgrimage. I would suggest to you that the language of pilgrimage ought to be read in this section. If you go back to verse 13, chapter 11, verse 13, it's referring to the patriarchs. It's referring to Isaac and Jacob, particularly. And I don't think that it should be read as referring to all who had preceded Abraham just because of the language. When he, for example, says that, that, that if, they, if they were looking for a homeland on earth, they would have had time to return to, to their homeland, Mesopotamia. I don't suggest, I don't think that it would refer to all who had gone before. So I think it refers to Abraham's immediate descendants. But he says, these all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So God had given the promise of land, of an innumerable descendant, of blessing to the nations. The patriarchs, Abraham and his immediate descendants, did not receive the full installment of these promises. But they saw them at a distance. They could see them in the future. and They, they embraced them. They, they received them. And the, the, the reason I, I draw attention to this verse is precisely because of how he describes these patriarchs to whom the promises were given. He says that they confessed homologia. This is not an embarrassment here. They confessed that what? They were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And so what I'm arguing then is that the better country is the ultimate goal of pilgrimage. These confess that they were aliens and strangers. They were pilgrims. They were sojourners. And one of the things that you know about sojourners really is that they don't belong to a particular country. And the reason they confessed that they did not belong is because, as one writer says, they were regulated by a firm conviction that God would fulfill his promise that he had given. And they were looking forward to it, and they did not view the fulfillment of the promise as occurring in the land of Canaan. So they continued looking at a distance. They were strangers and pilgrims. And these two terms, in, indeed constitute a high end yes, because they form a single idea. We're not seeing two different things here. These patriarchs regarded themselves as temporary residents in the land. They determined consciously to live as sojourners without the privileges of citizenship. They accepted, embraced their temporary resident status because they were a people in transition, a people in transit, en route to a different land. 
And I think that verse 15 makes this clear. In verse 14, for example, the writer says that the reason that they consider themselves in transit sojourners is because they were seeking a homeland. A homeland. They were looking for a homeland. And verse 15 tells us what the homeland is not. It is not Mesopotamia. For had it been Mesopotamia, if they were looking for a homeland, they would have had ample time to return to Mesopotamia. And that is why verse 16 tells us what the homeland is for which they were looking. But now they desire a better. That is a heavenly country. These patriarchs were resident aliens and primarily because of the influence of Abraham. They didn't concoct the idea of living as strangers in the land. This is something that they saw and experienced with their father Abraham. And so in verse 9 of the same passage, we are told, But Abraham, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, not, and he went out not knowing where he was going. But he dwelt, by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country. Abraham himself was the original passerby in transit. This is a guy who was hanging out in the transit lounge at the airport. It, was, it would have been Abraham. <laughs> yet two things characterize his life. He had a tent because it signals the transiency of life. And he had the altar wherever he went. He set up an altar because he recognized that all of life was to be lived as worship to God. But you see, they were, as an entire family, sojourners. He was called, Abraham, to abandon his most natural attachments, the, the very pillars of human trust, like his nation in Ur of Mesopotamia, his religious stance and allegiance to the moon god there, his ethnic roots, his Shetite tribe and Terite clan. He was told to give it all up. And when he arrived in Canaan, he refused to put down permanent roots, opting for a transient lifestyle in a movable tent. And apart from a, a little plot, a, a burial site that he owned, he did not own anything else in the land. Acts 7 verse 5. The, the, the fact that he was a temporary resident suggests his alienation from the larger culture. And that this alienation stemmed from the realization that the prosperity that God had promised him exceeded finite territory on the Mediterranean shore. This yearning of the patriarchs and for a country of their own is a witness to the Christian community then and now of the reality of a homeland. And it is simultaneously an invitation to embrace a life of pilgrimage. That, he that Hebrews pictures the Christian life primarily as pilgrimage, cannot be successfully challenged. There is a metaphor of movement that runs as a scarlet thread throughout this epistle. If you go back to chapter 3 and 4, he focuses on the wilderness generation and their tragic forfeiture of rest because of unbelief. And he tells them the promise of rest remains, but they should fear lest they come short. And the rest he envisions in chapter 4, verse 9, is the sabbatismus, that eschatological rest of God. Additionally, the vocabulary of movement, the metaphor of journey, is found, for instance, in the call to believers to approach. So the writer would say, let us draw near with true hearts in full assurance, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience in chapter 10, 22. Or in appeals to advance when he says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance. You see, these are metaphors of movement. I understand you can go to the gym and go on a treadmill and you're running, but you don't move. You know, you're not really advancing. But I'm not sure that this is the kind of race in which we are involved. That the heart of a race is movement. And so you see the writer of Hebrew does have this notion of movement 
here throughout this epistle. You'll find in chapter 13, the last chapter of the book, he says, Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach, for here we have no continuing city. Chapter 13, 13 to 14. So first of all, this heavenly country is the ultimate goal of pilgrimage. Believers are a people on the move. And paradoxically, the better country for which these patriarchs hungered belongs to the future. And yet at the same time, it is present. So, the, so I, I suggest to you that Hebrews construes the kingdom of God in terms of the now and the not yet. And in that sense, his eschatology must be seen as similar to that of the Apostle Paul and the rest of the New Testament. Believers, he says in chapter 12, 22, have already come to the heavenly city. And there the perfect tense is used. When they were converted, believers had their citizenship in heaven, as we saw in Philippians chapter 3. We are citizens of heaven. The, the, in a sense, the, the age to come has already invaded invisibly this present age. But in a real sense, Christ's coming, which one writer sees as a primary eschatological event, it was ushered in by the incarnation, by his death and ascension. And yet, nevertheless, though this better country is yet present, it is not yet consummated. And believers are people on the march to this home. Secondly, the better country upon which the patriarchs set their hearts is essentially or oh, sorry, bears essentially the quality of permanence. It is not only the goal of pilgrimage, but it bears the essential quality of permanence. So when the question is asked, why did they reject Canaan and the earthly sphere for the heavenly? What is it about the heavenly that caused them to desire a better country? Part of the answer, I would suggest to you, it is because it bears this essential quality of permanence. Permanence. There is a cosmological dualism, I think, identified in Hebrews, where the earth is viewed as inferior and the heavenly as superior. And you see it in a number of ways. You see it, for example, in chapter 9, where this tent, this earthly tent, is seen as temporary. Christ ministers into the permanent heavenly tent. There are several ways in which the writer points out that heaven is superior or the heaven realm is superior. And so at the heart of the writer's contention that, that heaven is better is the notion that it is permanent. The reason that the patriarchs did not consider Canaan to be the better country it is because they recognize it was marked by temporality, by impermanence. See, they, like Abraham, in, a, in other words, they share the same perspective about heaven and earth as Abraham did. And one of the reasons why Abraham was dwelling in tents, we are told, and it was the same reason why they were looking for a better country, it is because we are told for Abraham, he waited for the city with, which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. Abraham was waiting ex expectantly for a stable, secure, lasting, permanent city. And the patriarchs, when they were looking for a better country, did not just see it as the goal of their pilgrimage, but as essentially permanent. They were looking for a better immovable city, a city built by God himself, designed and built by God himself. This permanent better country is labeled in chapter 12 as the unshakable kingdom. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. The term unshakable throws into sharp relief the transient material universe described in the same chapter, chapter 12, verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, that is Moses, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promising, 
yet once more I shake not only the heaven, but also but not only the earth, but also the heaven. It's referring to the heaven and earth, the material creation. God will one day shake this creation. It's fascinating, in a sense, that the patriarchs recognized that terra firma was not really that firm. That this is not going to last. This is, you see, divine illumination that was given to the patriarchs. And silver commence illuminating me that, unlike the earthly Jerusalem, prey to all manner of violence and corruption and profanation throughout history, this heavenly city truly does have foundations that will not be shaken. Indeed, that city's foundation will enable it alone to stand after the eschatological shaking. When the Lord will one day shake this world, the kingdoms of this world will fall, and the only kingdom, the only city that will remain and will not be removed is the better country, the heavenly country. And precisely because this is a fleeting creation, we are told in the comparison between Jesus and angel earlier in chapter 1, quoting from Psalm 102, the, the writer says, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. See, there is talking about our Lord Jesus Christ who is eternal. But it, in contrast to that, we see that this earth is temporary. I think just one, one, one fascinating issue here is the, the, the writer talks about the world being changed may not mean that it will be completely destroyed because the term that is used here, at least the verb that is used, change, refers to make something other, to make something into something else or different. And it might mean that though there is a sharp duality between heaven and earth, we may not go as far as on one suggesting that the, 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 that Hebrew favors this earthly creation, as some have suggested, but neither are we to go to the extent to suggest that the Lord will one day discard the entire creation. For the language there is of changing and perhaps repristination, purgation. You see, the better country is a permanent country. It's the only country that will last. Kingdoms will rise and they will fall, but this kingdom will never fail. And this is the kingdom, the better country, that the patriarch sought. Thirdly, and more significantly, the better country of the patriarchs serves as the locus of God's immediate presence. Now, I would suggest to you that this was the driving issue behind their search for a better country, because precisely this is where God's presence dwells. You know, verse 16b discloses the upshot of the yearning for the better country, and I think that is intriguing, because it says, now, but now they desire better, that is a heavenly country, therefore, what's the result of their yearning? Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. He identifies with his people. And he identifies with them in the sense that he will bless them. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. And the reason he is not ashamed to be called their God is because he has prepared a city for them. I know that it is hackneyed to say that heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people, but it is true and worth remembering. It is a place of God's dwelling. It is not the platonic world of ideas, the unreal world versus this material world which is, work, which is real. This heavenly country where God dwells is a concrete world. And silver defines this city, this prepared city for which they, are, they were yearning as the place where God has always been and where God's presence is known in its fullness and not in any dim reflection. God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. But in heaven, he is particularly displayed in his glory, in the fullness of his being. You see, 
If you go to Hebrews chapter 12, you will find that this city for which they desired is essentially the, the, the locus of divine presence. If you, if you read in verse 22, 24, he says, but we have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, and the spirit of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than the blood or that of Abel. Well, what's going on here? I would suggest to you that when he defines the heavenly city, he calls it Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. But at the heart of the description of heaven, it is that it is the city of the living God. And, it, and I would suggest it does not just mean that it belongs to God, but it is also the city where God dwells. And I want to suggest to you that this picture of the heavenly Jerusalem is a picture of a populated place, not only a prepared place, but populated. There, those who have gone before are there. They are there with angels in festal garments, in festal array. But at the center of the vision of the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, the better country that they were seeking, at the center of this vision is God the judge. And in Hebrews, God is a consuming fire. But yet these, the firstborn, the church of the firstborn, they're there before the judge. And they're not consumed. Because right there at the center of the vision is the Lamb whose blood speaks not of justice but of mercy. Whose blood offered a perfect sacrifice and redeemed. Whose blood cleanses their consciences and opens a new and living way to God. It is Jesus, you see, who is at the center of this vision who offered the greater and more perfect sacrifice. He did so in a more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation. And it is this Jesus who was passed through the heavens this figure, the physical sphere, the material sphere, is passed through the heavens into the third heavens, into the very presence of God, and now resides at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high, where he performs his priestly work of representation in the presence of God for us, we are told in chapter 9, 24. Christ does his work, his ongoing work of mediation, of representation for us, as our mediator in the presence of God. That's where God's presence is. And that's what the patriarchs were looking for. Not a realm, but God. And thus the pastor, like the apostle Paul, conceives of the better country or the heavenly city as preeminently the state of immediate vision and of perfect communion with God and Christ. I know you have been patient, and so I will not tax your patience, your patience much longer, but let me draw a few observations. Hebrews manifest that believers are temporary residents, and the Christian life is a pilgrimage by faith to a better country. And it means that for all the blessings we have here in this land and for which we ought to be grateful and thankful to God, daily. We should never ever forget where our true country lies. We should never forget what is our true country. Gary Ingrig, whose writings often prove stimulating, the work on judges is one of the finest works, devotional, warm, helpful, insightful. He, he has a book entitled True North. And he illustrates the necessity of knowing our country when he says, when he, when he points it to what he calls a Schultz test, George Schultz was the Secretary of State under Ronald, Ronald Reagan. And Schultz was, a, was the one, one of his duties was to appoint ambassadors to different countries. And so when a, when a person was going to be appointed to a country, he would go before Schultz, and he, Schultz in the discussion would 
had a globe in the, in the corner of the room, and he would say to the fellow who was going to go to a new country, now go spin that globe, put your finger on where you're going. And the guy, go put your finger on your country. And the guy would go over there and spin the, country, spin the globe and put his finger on it. Then one day, Mike Manfield, was a, who was a longtime senator, came before Schultz, and he did the same thing, tell him, go over there, point your finger on the globe, find your country. And Manfield went over, spun the globe, and pointed his finger on the United States and said, that's my country. So Schultz altered the test. And whenever people came in, spun the globe, he would tell them about Manfield. And he would say, you may serve in another country, but don't forget which is your country. We may have citizenship here on earth in this nation, but our true home is in a better place, a better country. And we are pilgrims. You know, this, this, this understanding solves a lot of problems. Because if this really is our country, our only country, or our primary country, we'll be up and down with the stock market. You know, we'll be stressed out over who is prime minister and who is not. We'll be following all the things that are happening on a global level with great anxiety. But we can be free from all of that. Because fundamentally, while we live here, serve here, we belong to a better country. And we are pilgrims. It means then as pilgrimage that part and parcel of pilgrimage are the ideas of separation. There must be a distinction between ourselves and the culture because we do not belong. It's very hard if you're born Canadian, speak the language, speak the jargon, enjoy the food and so on, wear the same clothing, there's not much separation in culture, but morally and spiritually there must be a distinction because pilgrimage is always, always a separation. There's always separation and there's always movement. Bonyan captures that movement in Pilgrim's Progress when he's moving to that celestial city. And we should be drawing closer and closer to the Lord, conforming more and more to his image, as we've been reminded this morning. Pilgrimage demands separation, it demands movement. And I want to suggest it demands hardship. People can go off to the Hajj in Saudi Arabia and they'll fly in a plane. It's, it's not, I, don't think, <laughs> I don't think it's very difficult. But in olden days, pilgrimage was traveling by foot or by animal, horseback or whatever it is, over vast terrain, difficult. And when we recognize that we are pilgrims on this earth, we also must take on board the notion that it will require by separating ourselves, it will bring with it its own share of hardship. Furthermore, precisely because the better country is a permanent country, it means this is the country in which we must invest. It doesn't mean that we can't invest in the stock market here. We, we can invest in Bay Street. But our true investment must be in that which will last, that which we, we can never lose, that our ultimate investment must be in this unshakable kingdom, this unshakable realm, from which our Lord Jesus Christ will one day return, not as an unknown Messiah, but the Jesus who has already lived on earth, who will come again for his people. And because we have this assurance that our search is not in vain, we must so live and serve while we on earth the kingdom that is above the city that is the heavenly Jerusalem. But we also need to remember that the better country is God's country. And you and I, we belong to God's country. It's God's country where God and the Lamb dwell. And it demands that as we live, that we too must be future eschatological looking in our orientation, that our hearts must be set there. That's where our hearts must be, in that which is yet to come. You see, as Augustine saw in the city of God, that God's reward to his people will be God himself, the best, 
and the greatest of all possessions. And it is to that we look. We look to that better country, which is Yahweh Shammah. The Lord is there.